always enjoy their little, uh, what do they call it, finger foods. We're going to move into our next uh, portion of the agenda. This afternoon we have uh, with us Doc, Dr. James Berenick. Uh, Dr. Berenick was born in Alberta, Canada, which is just south of Banff. Very beautiful country, I might add. He earned his uh, honors degree in chemistry and microbiology, his medical degree and a unique bachelor's degree in medicine, specializing in cardiology at the University of Manitoba, Winnipeg, Canada. Thereafter, he moved to Akron, Ohio for his internship and internal medicine residency at St. Thomas Hospital. After another year of internal medicine res residency at Duke University Medical Center in North Carolina, he trained with Dr. C.E. Buckley III in allergy and clinical immunology. He moved to the laboratory of Dr. Michael Kalliner at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in Beth Bethesda, Maryland, and there began his long-standing collaboration with Dr. Kimahiro Okubo, I hope I pronounced that correctly. After two years of studying neuropeptides, he joined Dr. Peter Barnes' laboratory at the National Heart and Lung Institute, and in, uh, that's at the Brompton Hospital in, in, in London, England. <coughs> Excuse me, Dr. Brennack returned to Washington, D.C. following that, and at Georgetown University, where he currently uh, serves as an associate professor with tenure in the Department of Medicine. I'm very privileged to uh, welcome Dr. James Baranek to our session this afternoon. Please give a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. First things first. If I can have Dave and Jim and Denise come up, please, and face the audience. <laughs> I'd like to thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And since you all serve under president at discretion, there up. I wanted to give you a small gift as a thank you. I've got a big gift. We always do that. Thank you. Uh, this is a tremendous honor for me to be able to come up here and uh, to talk to folks. Uh, I've been so delighted that, uh, to see good friends here who have come and taken part in our research studies before and to be able to uh, hopefully provide some clinical overlap but maybe heresy. Um, that's kind of my job. Uh, We have, this has been very, very enlightening, especially with uh, Dr. Steele's discussion, and now um, if the Institute of Medicine has decided that this is an exposure-related problem, then I must change my tune. No, it's not compatible with <laughs> It is. It is not, it is. that's right. Um, one of the things that, uh, has been very confusing is uh, what is uh, the history of Gulf War illness. Um, if you go back to uh, I think it's Deuteronomy or Leviticus, they had the uh, draft regulations for the Israeli army at that time. Um, it was all males, but there were significant exclusions, and one of those was uh, if you were newly married, another was if you had a crop in the field that needed harvest, and the third has been translated as cowardice. <laughs> and, but the translation doesn't give you the sensation of fear or cowardice. It suggests that you were in a war and couldn't go back. That's not being a Hebrew scholar, I can't tell you if that's the truth. 
but it makes me wonder about this from general phenomenon that has been seen after many wars. That's the, my Sumerian isn't very good either, so I don't have any of the cuneiform tablets that are translated. You buy that? I've got some lovely land in Florida or something. Now, uh, the Gulf War illness, some people have said, has been reported as Lacosta syndrome, which was after the Civil War. So that there's been, and then uh, the other syndromes that have been discussed uh, earlier. I think uh, Dr. Steele's done a terrific job of reiterating what Dr. Haley said about the possibility of PB and other exposures in addition to some sort of genetic predisposition. And part of Dr. Haley's research has been the predisposition based on uh, this PON1 gene. We actually are looking at a different one called CNDP1 that I'll tell you about later. And I know that with future studies, there will be a whole host of additional genes that may be found to play different roles in the spectrum that, it, that may include Gulf War illness. The heresy I'm going to present is that this is part of a final common pathway of illness affecting the brain. And that this is an illness of a pain in the brain, a strain in the brain, and what we need to do in part is retrain the brain. Does anybody have uh, Aunt Millie? Or in my case, Aunt Ruth? Aunt Ruth, all of her life, my mother tells me, has had problems. She's had joint pain, she's had muscle pain, she's had stomach problems, she's had this kind of problem and that kind of problem, always different, always changing. Um, nowadays, depending on who she saw, she may get a different diagnosis. If she went to a rheumatologist, she would get a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. If she went to a so-called immunologist, allergist, or um, other person who believed in chronic fatigue syndrome, that's the diagnosis that they would get. The different is there a difference between these two? Well, in the classic uh, 1990 definition, if you guys can't see my writing, please move up. 1990, this included tender points, which meant that you pressed on the skin and it hurt at 11 of 18 points. And that was thought to be fundamental. Now it's been known that that's a generalized total body phenomenon that's related to your ability to control pain messages. There have now come out some 2010 criteria that have gotten rid of that completely. This part historically came out of an epidemic of fatigue where, um, for example, one, one uh, town in Michigan, a large number of adolescent girls with women were found to have sudden onset fatigue. It came on like the flu, flu-like complaints. The CDC came up and investigated, and sure enough, they found that this was 
an outbreak of chronic fatigue syndrome. But the interesting thing is they also surveyed three surrounding towns, and they found exactly the same rate of chronic fatigue syndrome. But no epidemic there. The difference was the first town had a doctor that was aware of chronic fatigue syndrome. And so when he saw these people, he made a diagnosis. The other towns, they, doc, their doctors, they had never heard of this. So they didn't make a diagnosis. Is this an epidemic? Or is this just a realization by the medical community? And I think that's what it was. The one doctor had an idea. He could make a diagnosis and the others didn't have the information. I think that's a major task facing us. How do we go and translate this into JAMA articles? Into articles that people are going to read and believe because it's not just a report online, it is in New England Journal of Medicine. That's going to turn people's heads. That's going to be a dynamic that I think will completely change the way that the VA views this. Every GP that I've talked to views this set of illnesses as well. <coughs> One of the ways I'm doing this right now is I'm collaborating with a friend of mine who's in family practice to write a series of reviews on these illnesses so that for her, who never believed in this diagnosis, now that she's seen it, been educated as to what to look for, she can get rid of these crocs. You know? You know, are, have you been told it's all in your head? Yeah. yeah. That you're a croc, you know, get out of my office. Doctor, you told me it's all in my head. <laughs> and what else did I tell you? It's all in your head. That's now the mission statement of my laboratory. And everybody who comes and works for me, they better understand why. There is a doctor's view of your head. If it's your heart, you can listen to your heart. You can listen to your lungs, you can feel your liver. You can't stick your fingers in the brain. If you do, it's not a very good outcome. I've had patients come to me who want to donate their brains, and I told them they had to wait until they died. They come and wanted to give biopsies, but I don't know for sure, at least back then, where to biopsy. When I went to the Institutional Review Board to have that approved, they said that that wasn't a good idea. So instead, much to your horror, I've become the uh, Marquis de Sade, so, so to speak, of spinal taps, because I can't get into your brain, but the fluid that's around it, we can stick a needle into it, and we can take a look at the fluid by doing a spinal tap. And that's what we've done in two studies. We have provision, we have provision to do it in a third study. <coughs> by studying what is here, we can get an idea as to what's going on in this black box that is the most complicated organ in our body. Now, uh, as I go along, I'm going to give you some bits and pieces about our results that we've found from these studies and the distinctions that we've been able to make as far as uh, chronic fatigue as a focus compared to healthy control subjects. Then I want to throw out to you guys 
some questions about who should be our healthy controls for auditory illness. Um, one of the other things that we're doing now is, like Dr. Haley, like Dr. Lang, who spoke yesterday, the techniques of now using functional MRI to look at the subtle structures that are inside the brain. Is opening up, is opening up this disease, and is opening up this black box. And I think that in the next five years, we're going to see so much progress in this area that it's going to tip our concepts of medicine on its head. And down the road, studies like this will become standard with specific types of challenges such as tests of memory being done under fMRI for diagnostic purposes. We'll get to that a little bit later. Now, um, I know a bunch of you have completed my uh, little questionnaire as part of the, the study, but I wanted to hand this out just uh, so you can follow along. Uh, with, because I wanted to go over some of the hot data that has come from your participation in our studies. And I think this is an ideal place to let you guys know first. And uh, Dr. Steele, if you'll please give me that back and leave the room. <laughs> okay. So, one of the qu the question is, what? No. Ah, it's on the video tape. It's on the DVD. It still has to go through peer review. It needs all the statistics. Oh, the rest of the statistics. Yeah, and the deal. Don't worry, Jim Bunker's good at the end of so. <laughs> There you go. Okay. One of the things that, that we did is we wanted to, to use some criteria in order to define a patient population. And so one that I've used for the last uh, 10, 12, 14 years is this simple little questionnaire, which is how severe are your symptoms in the last six months? And this, these nine points are the chronic fatigue syndrome criteria. So this has allowed us to take people that have Gulf War, CFS diagnosed by other physicians, fibromyalgia, healthy controls, sinusitis, allergic rhinitis, asthmatics, and other people who take part in many, many different types of studies have them come in, fill out a questionnaire, and at least we get a set of numbers that allow us to uh, ascertain whether they meet criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, looking at the, uh, actually, if we look at the Gulf War group, where does the notes go? Um, we found that 87% of our Gulf War group met chronic fatigue syndrome criteria. Uh, the old fibromyalgia criteria was found in 34%. That's with the tenderness. And we also found multiple chemical sensitivity in 22%. Well, Chemical sensitivity, of course, is another one of those diseases that's in your head, right? It's all in your head. Because that's where your trigeminal chemosensory nervous system is. In the nose, you have nerves that respond to numerous chemicals 
with complex receptors. It is not the same as your smell system, but what it allows is for you to respond to agents that would be in smoke, that would be in hairspray, in paint solvents, and other <coughs> potential toxicants, and to send a message to your brain that you're in a bad environment. Um, in the chronic fatigue group that we had, uh, we've got 94% uh, met this criteria in the questionnaire. 48% uh, had fibromyalgia, and 38% had multiple chemical sensitivity, and that fits with uh, 0, 0, and 3% in the healthy controls. One of the things is that these are fairly similar. So that at least there's uh, a subset within the Gulf War people who do meet the criteria for chronic fatigue. And so we've got 87% here, and we have another 30% of Gulf War that are not CFS. This is not to say that there is an overlap with Parkinson's. There is an overlap with the multiple sclerosis type of uh, phenotype or expression of illness. Chronic fatigue syndrome is yuppies, you know, yuppie women, right? <laughs> well, yeah, it is, because we found uh, percent males We've got 15% in our CFS group, and that compared to our uh, healthy control, I don't know how healthy it is if we've only got 32 men in it. She got it. I already. Don't look at the worry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But if you go to the if you go to the Gulf War people. Uh, we have 69% males taking part in our studies and who have come in. This is part of three cohorts who've been recruited. What's curious is just about everything else I'm going to tell you is identical except this. So this, what is it about civilians? who have this set of symptoms that I gave you, as opposed to the subset of Gulf War people who have these symptoms. Now, one of the cardinal features here of chronic fatigue syndrome is having headaches. And I'm going to mention this first because it's a, as a result of the participants in this room that we can come to these, this particular set of conclusions that I have. Um, one of the people working with me wants to be a neurologist and just got into a neurology program. We noticed that uh, the headaches were very peculiar. Um, we had headaches that were coming up after people had their lumbar punctures in particular. And when we went over the history, uh, there were some uh, intriguing patterns. The most common types of headaches are going to be tension headaches. After that, it's going to be migraine headaches. And then after that, you have a series of others, including cluster headaches, um, and uh, sinus headaches. Breaking it down, um, migraine, we found in 70% of the Gulf War, 89% of the chronic fatigue, and the approximately expected rate of 14% 
in uh, the healthy controls. While you're on the subject of migraines, because I don't, I do have CFS, but don't have headaches, but I was told I have ophthalmic migraines, non-headache, blurry vision. Would that fall into that category of migraine? Ophthalmic headaches, that's what the question is. I, I, I don't feel pain, but I, my eyes get blurry. So there are two types of migraines. There are migraines with auras and migraines without auras. One third have auras, two thirds don't. And in children, you can have an aura and then stomach pain. In other people, you can get an aura and no headache. So yeah, an ophthalmic migraine would fit with that. The uh, split that we found pretty much across the board for all three groups was this same one-third, two-thirds breakdown. The reason this is important is, you know, when I was in medical school, everybody was taught what a migraine was, how you diagnose it. We had patients come in who had chronic fatigue syndrome, hence number seven, headache, CFS headache. They went to their neurologist, and their neurologist didn't know what to do for them. We looked at them and, hey, you've got a migraine. <laughs> so let's treat it like a migraine. We gave you sumatriptan, they got better. It's another, it's another drug, but it's a drug that they can use when they get a headache in order to stop that pain. And once you stop that pain, you may prevent progression to other complaints, other worsening of other sensory uh, complaints. Yes, ma'am. Sir, a lot of time when you have tell my neurologist about the headaches, uh, he'll tell me like the medication that I'm on, which doesn't either stop me the headache, or you take a tick aspirin or something like that. It feels, my head feels like an 18 is I, I, I can't address an individual without uh, in the short time available. However, there is another very important category here of chronic daily headaches. Mm -hmm. And they are a real problem from a neurologist's perspective. And there's now a feeling that they are the long-term consequence of migraines or tension headaches leading down find a common pathway. And the treatments for those are very controversial. So that they may be trying to avoid giving you medicines that they do know what no good. But we have to talk at length another time to get more information. Now, um, remember the migraine, because there's some, I'll tell you a little bit about the pathology of those in a little bit. Um, how many people here have sinus? What is it? Congestion? <coughs> yeah, what is it? Exactly. Has one. <laughs> sinus. Sinus headaches or sinus? Okay. What I what they say in Washington D.C. is I come in and I got sinus. I'm an allergist. They come in, I got sinus. Well, it turns out they're allergic. So one of the important things you have to do here is find out that people have simple things. Do they have allergic rhinitis, and is that the cause of their nasal complaints? The feeling that they have chronic sinusitis is uh, generally not the case. However, in, a, in our recent group of patients, we found more sinusitis than I anticipated. Again, because they're getting fMRI studies. Uh, we just completed a paper as well on sinusitis, and it turns out this is defined by the International Headache Society, and the way it's defined, it should never occur. <laughs> 
yet they call it, they say it should be it may be up to four or to six percent of headaches but it's they got it all backwards the uh, nasal symptoms are also of interest to me because hey the nose is a great place to study the interaction between the lining of, a, of an organ just like the gut and the innervation, how the nerves regulate mucosal function. And I presented this um, at Georgetown, and the head of GI came up and he just was disgusted by this thought of somebody spraying salt water up the nose and collecting liquid gold, uh, I mean, nasal secretions. <laughs> and instead he said, you know, come on, everybody, who, nobody would do that. Everybody would much rather have a uh, rectal wash and, and challenge and, and collect it that way. Everybody would. And all I could say is the defense rests. I don't like the rear end. Now, um, let's get back to these symptoms for just a second. The, uh, if you see the scoring system that we set up there, the, I just want to bring your attention to three to four as a moderate to severe, and then one, zero, one, two being the lower levels. And if you go down, you can, I, I can't show you the statistics except, here you go. <laughs> It turns out that for the chronic fatigue and the Gulf War group, it's identical. For each of these nine, the scores are generally about 3.5, all the way down. So there's a very close correspondence between these symptoms, this final family <coughs> pathway, and what's occurring in 87% uh, of the Gulf War people. Yes, sir. What if you don't, for instance, get a sore throat, which I don't, mm -hmm. but I have everything else? I have, you got to remember this is a statistical analysis. So you, for CFS, chronic fatigue syndrome, you need to have fatigue and any four of the last eight. See, I'm a brain. I like to shoot a perfect score. And I didn't. <laughs> 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 I'm so really bad. sorry that you live a disappointed life. By the way, thanks for the hat. I'm sorry you put it in my head when you did the biopsy. <laughs> <laughs> what biopsy? Lobotomy? Is that it? Is it lobotomy? Now, given this similarity in scores, um, I wanted to ask if any of you guys had particular questions about any of these symptoms. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I was diagnosed with non-allergic chronic rhinitis. Yep. So I've got that constant post-nasal drainage. And so I'm just curious, how does that work with the sinusitis thing? Okay. <laughs> um, 2005, I published a paper in the American Journal of critical care or uh, respiratory critical care medicine um, where we found that what, if you spray high doses of salt into your nose very concentrated salt you get a burning sensation but in in well I had trouble getting it through the IRB as well but it, once again it's a Jesuit University so I told them that the Dead Sea was close to the Bible and the Dead Sea is very concentrated salt so after that I was able to get it through and we spray a little bit in and it turns out that for symptoms there's our healthy controls for the amount of salt that we spray in there's the chronic fatigue syndrome, and I would anticipate the Gulf War if we had enough to actually separate as far as symptoms are concerned. But when we look at how much 
uh, actually is in the secretions in terms of what type of materials are being secreted. It turns out this is the symptoms here go to your brain through the nerves. But the nerves also branch off and while they're still in the nose, they cause your nose to secrete lots of mucus. So Those that explains the mucus that yeah. you get. I guess it goes down the sinus thing. It goes down back into I've always got a lump in my throat. So although I do smoke, sorry, no, well, I do deep voice, but that's that's <laughs> why. Well the other thing is that if you if we draw this graph out here for the healthy controls, this is what you see. They get a nice dose response. But if you take the chronic fatigue people, they start out a little bit high, but they have no response. What that tells me is that the nerves in the nose aren't working properly. So the irritants here are causing abnormal secretions, abnormal responses. And stimulating this nerve is going up to the brain and causing lots of sensations of pain, of burning, of fullness. But it doesn't have the proper end effect here. I'm thinking that this is similar to what happens in irritable bowel syndrome, irritable bladder syndrome, and other uh, disorders that occur within uh, your airways and intestines. There was another question, man. It was, I've been using nasal irrigation wash for symptom management for quite some time, and recently when I was trying to set one of my kids up to do it for her own issues, discovered that I've been using a hypertonic solution all this time when I should have been using an isotonic solution. Right. Is that what you're talking about there, that the, the, the irritant is, doesn't trigger the appropriate response? Uh, what you're using would be three times normal saline. Mm -hmm. This is one times normal saline. And we get up to 24 times okay. over here. So that's okay. it, but just a tiny little squirt, like two drops. Um, there was a lot of controversy earlier this decade that the ENT surgeons were recommending this. It turns out, in fact, it's the volume that you use and the frequency, and whether you use a nasal irrigation device like a water pick. If you've had surgery, that's the way to go. Otherwise, I recommend to all of you, if you've got nasal irritation, use a salt water nasal spray. You talked about nerves in the nose. I noticed, and I don't know if anybody else has this, but for several years now, uh, I didn't used to be like this. If I'm sleeping and I start smelling food, like if my wife's cooking, it doesn't matter what it is. It's not any particular food, but it bothers me beyond belief. So can there be a hypersensitivity to certain smells? Because you're almost talking almost like a dulling of the senses. The smells. But I mean, can you be hyper to I can say the point where you can't sleep because you're smelling something that, you know. I think you've hit on something very important because here it's a decrease in this secretory function. But if you recall over here, this would be an increase in pain. And if instead of pain, we say that this is some sort of irritant, I don't know about your wife, but maybe she's burning all the food. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't bring her along, so I don't know. That's, oh, no. That sends the <laughs> message to your brain. It doesn't cause me pain, it's just that I, I, I wake up and I can't go back to sleep. That's a neurological arousal all the same. Yeah. Bingo. Yeah. yeah. An arousal. Yeah. Not, well, not that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I have a chemical sensitivity to smell. And Which? I, I have to be careful. I can walk in a room and. Uh, how many other people have multiple chemical sensitivity? Can I raise my feet too? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's exactly and, right. And it just, I have to be careful because my nose starts. 
breathing in a second because those are I think important parts that are previously not so much recognized. Doc, I've been aroused. I have a question for you. <laughs> so, we have an arousal here. Should he's up. 10, he's up. <laughs> should number 10 be a concern that you list medications? Because I, I, I know there's a lot of Gulf War vets that bring multiple bags uh, uh, I've seen it myself. Uh, I personally am on 13 different medications. Uh, CV and MBA, because they're like Lyrica and Cymbalta are not in the VA system, so I have to get that through CV. And let me tell you, if I wasn't on Lyrica uh, and some of the other things that I'm on, I would be able to function. Uh, wouldn't you be concerned with, because I have chronic fatigue, with 13 drugs that I'm on right now, uh, and uh, wouldn't you want to know what the Gulf War vets are on compared to the, you know, other, you know, you're going to do a study with probably people that are not on medications, mm -hmm. and you're going to do a study with sick Gulf War vets that, you know, I'm just, you've got Gulf War vets that are on 30, 25, 30 different kind of medications. And we document all of those. Oh, that's this is one page out okay. of a forty page questionnaire, which I'd be happy to give you instructions on how to sign on in. Okay. All right. You know you had a forty page questionnaire. Oh yeah. This is I just been trying to limit it to just this overlap. Because okay. it's only one of a number that we've found. Okay. Very important. With the, with the Gulf War vets, one of the things I picked up early on with us is not only you know, the symptoms you're talking about, but the feeling that we were smelling things that no one else smelled. Mm -hmm. it, 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 uh, yeah. Olfactory hallucination type thing. Yeah. And Dr. Bob's lighter that said that really pointed to the pathway of exposure to the inhalation okay. and that it was very specific. I'm, I'm going to generalize that sensitivities for that. You can smell odors that nobody else can. And include that for the moment in this multiple chemical sensitivity, irritant sensitivity category. Because I think that it's a real part of this. I have a multiple chemical sensitivity, and sometimes whenever I bring certain things, it makes me irritable. I get no me. Yeah. It's like, it's like I turn into a monster. Bed, bath, and beyond, baby. So, we're, we're all over. This is going into your brain. So, it's going into this black box. What's the connection between that bad odor, irritant smell, and what's going on in your black box that leads to a change in mood? That part of the part of the Gulf War definition. Mood changes, irritability, cognition. Yeah. Sir, could I uh, make a comment or two about the uh, NCS um, as a civilian chemical sensitivity activist? First, as Ross, do you want to talk into the yeah. microphone? Yeah. 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 As a civilian chemical sensitivity yeah. activist, sir. No. <laughs> As a civilian chemical sensitivity activist, uh, about a third of people with chemical sensitivities have, have pesticide exposure. And as you saw in Ross Perot, uh, he was uh, doing studies including clopyrifos and getting positive results. And the end point seems to be brain inflammation. So you don't need the trigeminal nerve. Uh, we think that the cerebral vasculitis is one of the major pathways. It's, it's a generalized allergy reaction, and it just shuts down the blood flow of the brain. And that, well, and I'm gonna, gonna stop you there because we're gonna have lots of questions. We can talk about that after. But I agree with you that this is very important, and what you've raised is important. 
that a third of the people may have some kind of exposure. And in different people, as Dr. Haley said, what is that exposure? And what does it do to lead to long-term chronic changes? About a third are pesticides, about a third are solvents, right? about a third are captains, like the very reactive isocyanates. Right. And the, the, it turns out that there are some specific receptors for isocyanates that are on these nerves. Okay. And could trigger, I'll just throw that out. Now, uh, just to link the question about the medicine. When we look there, in women at least, there's a huge list of symptoms of multiple chemical sensitivity that are triggered by medicines. Thank you. That are triggered by medicines treated as if they are allergic. And as an allergist, I want to know what the mechanism is of the allergy. And it turns out, there are often increased adverse events of Gulf War chronic fatigue symptomatology. And that's what the people are complaining about. I get a lot of uh, my, I'm not on any medications to speak of at the moment. I've just gotten a few more to try because I react so badly to so much. But when I say it's not worth the side effects, it's treated as if I'm just being wimpy and I must not be complaining about anything that's all that serious if I'm not willing to put up with a few niggling side effects when the side effect is crippling. Uh, absolutely. Man, you can't stand the side effects. <laughs> you can't stand the truth about this drug. Well, You can't take the side effects. You, don't, you don't take the drug. Yeah. Uh, if you're not going to take the drug, then you don't really uh, want to get better. It, it's something being, you're clinging your uh, attention I'm for. Being I'm being yes. paternalistic because I'm the doctor. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And you're being non-compliant because exactly. you're not listening to me. Mm -hmm. So it's your problem. Mm -hmm. This and is say, a I, major I problem with doctors. Then, oh, well, you know, forget it. You might as well just throw yourself on the trash bin if you came off with your medication on your own. Uh, but it, it's a very real problem. If it sets off a reaction in my body that prevents me from absorbing the medication in the first place, if it's going straight through me, prevents me from deriving any benefit right. from it, why the hell would I take it? <laughs> exactly correct. And I think that that's where the individualization yeah. of the treatment has to come in. And the understanding that there can be a lot of sensitivity to these medicines. Um, when I start a treatment here, for example, many of you have been on Flexeril for, or have heard of it. Mm -hmm. When I start Flexeril, um, the prescribing instructions are 10 milligrams three times a day for muscle spasms. If you take 10 milligrams three times a day, I'll wake you up next exactly. week. Exactly. <laughs> so what we do is we, I start with five milligrams and have people cut it in half and they take it at night for a month. Then they increase by half a tablet a month and tell them in six months, mm. then we'll talk because you need that slow, gradual increase. We'll have some other ideas about that later. What's, how am I doing on time? Uh, actually, it's a little over. So okay. I would recommend we transition to plugging your studies to get folks to sign up. Oh, okay. And I highly recommend it. I, I have. The next speaker is sitting in the hallway that we set up. Right? Okay. Well, we've had uh, eight studies that we've completed uh, over the last decade. Right now, we have one that was funded uh, through the NIH, chronic fatigue syndrome. That was a lumbar puncture study. Uh, very successful recruitment. Thank you all for taking part. Greatly appreciated. Um, this is to go for protein analysis, and in fact, uh, when I get back on Monday, we're going to start processing the samples to send down to Alabama. Uh, we've got one, two preliminary sets of data that we're writing up at the moment. So more news later. So we didn't sign up for lumbar puncture, I don't For this part? No. That one, that one we stopped. Uh, what we have right now funded, importantly, the funding again through the CDMRP, the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program, is uh, 
a two-day study with exercise. The lot number nine here is exertional exhaustion. People exercise too much and they have to go to bed. Does that happen? Oh yeah. Yes, it does, absolutely. So why? What's the mechanism? That's what I want to know. Yeah. Well, what we're doing here is we're having people go into the fMRI scanner, have some special other testing. They do two days of bicycle exercise and then one four hour a day. Uh, no, two bicycle tests, uh, nothing like uh, Colonel Gingrich does. Um, not even the 25 minutes at 75% that they do in Utah. Uh, it's to your personal maximum. The O2 max is called. And then we repeat the fMRI afterwards. And if you want to have an LP, we can do an LP. It's in the protocol. But since there's some resistance, I can be flexible since we've got data here. The preliminary results here, um, there's a question of what can one person do? One person, we can't see any changes. But in the group we've done so far, we see changes that are very similar to what Dr. Haley is seeing. Different provocation. Uh, for this one, we're looking for 20 Gulf War, 20 healthy controls. Here's where we get into the issue of can we get 20 healthy Gulf War veterans to come and spend almost a week off of work, away from their families, to come in and get studied? Or, do I have to advertise at the unemployment office for age, gender, and race match people? Volunteer. Thank you. Come on down. And he lives in DC. Here's my card. There's another one right there. Here's my card. Yeah, I Okay. So with, with this one, again, the key is what is exertional exhaustion? And what is the what are the changes in the brain that result from this exhaustion? Third one is we're using a drug called carnosine, which is available over the counter some places. Uh, as a treatment in Gulf War illness. We're looking for about uh, 20 people all together to take part in this as well. <coughs> what does that carnosine do? This, this is uh, an antioxidant. The reason that we did this study is the first study we did looking at the spinal fluid, we found an enzyme that chops this stuff up. The reason we're doing cheek swabs for genetics is to find out if that enzyme is present in more of the Gulf War illness people compared to the healthy veterans. Chopping this up may be a part of the may set you up to be at risk for Gulf War illness. So we're testing that. The, the point is that we're trying to supplement and increase the brain levels of this, this material and the related material. And the, we're judging that based upon what's the change in uh, things like working memory by uh, functional MRI in different parts of the brain. Uh, this is one of those hated double-blind placebo-controlled studies where people are given placebo or they're given the drug. The reason I want to do that, though, is I don't want to do a study where everybody gets this and we get a placebo effect, where everybody shows a beneficial effect, every, and word gets out there that everybody should be using this. 
and it turns out to be bogus. If I'm going to do it, I want to do it once, and I want to do it right. And I want to give you guys a good idea as to whether or not to take this $60 a month health supplement. If it's helpful, that's great. If it isn't, don't waste your money. Is it that in chicken, for instance? I beg your pardon? Is, is the carnosine in chicken? It's in uh, many muscle tissue, and you can also get it from whey protein. And uh, the stuff we get is uh, synthetically produced. But yeah, protein. Um, now I'll stop there because we have a we have other studies. Feel free to get in touch if you like the website. You can go there. Um, there are some travel funds available for people who want to uh, come in and take part in this study. Uh, it's not a big budget uh, as far as what the, the CDMRP would give us, but it's uh, better than nothing. Okay. So I'd like to thank your, uh, thank your attendance in the studies. Thank you for your participation. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk. One last thing, let's get this better. Doctor, yes, sir. Doctor before you, uh, I would like you to take time or have one of your staff people take the time to uh, email me each one of the studies so I can get on the websites properly so that we can help you recruit people. Thank you. Make sure you put it in layman's terms. <laughs> okay. You know, some of us. The, there's a regulatory problem, but we can get around it. I know we can get around it. Either I throw the abstract up, up, up there or we get to let break, get it so that people can read. I understand it. We can link it to. I would also like to know this is a very nice and gentleman um, after the lumbar puncture study that I had. Uh, I was waiting on the one side of the, of the hospital for.